Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I mostly focus on sharing unsolved true crime. Today I want to share with you the unsolved case of Nicola Payne who's been missing from here in the UK for almost 32 years now. She was just 18 years old when she went missing and she'd be 50 years old today. That is a whole life miss and her family are desperate for some answers, for some closure. There are a number of cases from here in the UK that sort of really permeated the public consciousness. Think cases like Holly and Jessica, Sarah Payne, Millie Dowler. Most of these are solved. Nicola's is not, but still today in 2023, there are some big movements in her case. Just because 32 years have passed, it doesn't mean this case is never getting solved. Every day with modern technology, modern understanding, old cold cases are being closed and there is a chance in Nicola's. Nicola Payne was born here in the UK in the early 1970s. She grew up in Coventry with her parents and her four siblings. She was actually the youngest of five and the only girl. So she grew up really headstrong. She was able to stand up for herself. Also, she was the baby of the family. She was always protected. You know how it is with siblings. They'll always be the ones to be meanest to you, but also the ones to protect you the most fiercely. And I can imagine that's even more exaggerated when you're the baby and the only sister. At the time, Nicola disappeared, her parents sort of looking forward to a new chapter in their life. Their baby Nicola was now a legal adult, she was 18, and they'd had a really tough time raising her and her brothers. Her parents were excited for this new life of parenting grown-ups instead of children. But in one day, all that changed. The excitement was replaced with fear and worry. The family lived in Woodend, a residential suburb on the northeast side of Coventry, and at this time it was a very close-knit community. They had great neighbours and everyone was very friendly. You wouldn't really expect anyone around here to cause harm to a teenage girl on purpose. However, Coventry as a whole had a crime issue at this time, I mean still today. It has one of the highest crime rates in the Midlands. The city struggled throughout the 80s in the aftermath of the miners' strike, there was a problem with the younger generations and muggings, the murder rate was abnormally high. But this wasn't really something the Paynes worried about on a daily basis, it wasn't really something they thought about. They had good kids and Nicola stayed out of trouble. And being an 18 year old girl, Nicola of course loved to spend time with her friends and they enjoyed listening to music together. A couple of years beforehand, she'd got into a relationship with a boy called Jason Cook and she soon fell pregnant. Her father John said in the documentary about this case, The Never Ending Murder, that you can watch on Amazon Prime, that of course they were very disappointed when they found out that Nicola, their baby girl, was pregnant. Him and Nicola's mum, Marilyn or Maz, also got pregnant at a young age as well and they knew how difficult it was. Any parent wants their daughter to go out and experience life, but as soon as her son Owen was born, they couldn't imagine life any other way. Nicola was said to be a really amazing mother. She was absolutely besotted with her son and her whole life just revolved around him. He was the love of her life. Determined to give Owen the best life possible, Nicola and Jason bought a house nearby and John and her brothers spent three or four months doing it all up for her, like the goal was to be in the house by Christmas so she could give her son the perfect first Christmas and Nicola was just so excited about this. They had their moving day in the diary for December and she just couldn't wait, she just wanted to be a mum. Saturday the 14th of December 1991 was said to be a very foggy, grey, miserable day as so many December days here in the UK tend to be. And Nicola and Owen spent the previous night and the morning at Jason's parents' house on Winston Avenue, which is where Jason was obviously living at this time. By 12.30pm, Nicola hadn't come home to her parents' house on Woodway Close, and John was really starting to worry. Now, I'm not sure if there had been plans for Nicola to pop back or if she just always came home by a certain time, but we do know that Nicola did indeed leave Jason's to pop back home and pick up the keys to their house that they were about to move into. Just before 1pm, John decides to call Jason and ask where Nicola was. He was really, really worried at this point. And Jason responds that she left alone to walk home about 20 minutes ago. Now, John thought this was strange because A, Nicola never walked anywhere, but also B, because the walk home should have taken her an absolute maximum of eight minutes, likely more five or six minutes. If she left 20 minutes ago, she should be home by now. These two houses were really close together. Nicola had grown up in this area. She knew these roads like the back of her hand. She should be home. It's not like she would have got lost. 
He decides to give it a few minutes before going out to look for Nicola along with his son, one of Nicola's brothers, Nigel. Speaking to Mark Williams Thomas for the NewsQuest Investigates podcast, John describes the last time he saw Nicola, saying that he'd been at work all week and he got home on the Friday evening to find Nicola there with Owen. Around 8pm, Jason comes round and Nicola says that she's going to stay at his parents for the night. So John kisses his daughter and his grandson goodbye, thinking he's going to see them the next day. But of course, he doesn't. You never know when's going to be the last time you see somebody, so always take those moments. So with Nicola not having come home, John decides to go out and he looks across the field, hoping to catch sight of his daughter in the distance, but there's nothing. The quickest route between the two houses, and the one that Nicola most likely would have taken, was across an area known locally as the Black Pad, which is a mud track which linked the two different estates in this area. Children would often play on the Black Pad, it was a bit of sort of a playground area and a pathway on an old railway line. The soil was sort of very dark, black in colour, probably from the ash of the coal used on the trains, hence the name, the Black Pad. Whilst the Black Pad itself isn't a residential area, the area around it very much is. It's very, very built up and there are constantly people walking across this area. So John and Nigel walk the Black Pad, they walk to the shops, they go to Jason's house and find him and his brothers sat in the lounge. He asked all of them if they'd seen Nicola and they confirmed that no, she'd gone home, she'd walked over the Black Pad. As they walked, they talked to people and asked if anyone had seen Nicola and no one had. They called around local family members and asked if Nicola had stopped at any of their houses, but she hadn't. Pretty much all the family actually lived around this area on these estates, so if Nicola had a problem, she knew she could stop at any of these houses. I mean, her aunt and uncle literally lived right on the edge of the black pad. She would have gone straight there if something happened while she was walking across, but she didn't. John said his panic was increasing as he walked and looked and couldn't see her anywhere. He contacted Maz, his wife, and she came home from work saying that she just knew that something terrible had happened. She had a feeling in the pit of her stomach and soon they were fearing the worst. This was entirely unlike Nicola. She wouldn't have just left, especially seeing as she'd left her son Owen at Jason's. As it started to get dark around 3pm, the family realised that they were going to have to inform the police. This was clearly out of their hands. And it's kind of mixed signals as to whether the police took it seriously from the very beginning, because over that first weekend, the majority of this search was conducted by Nicola's family. The police, they sort of took in the report, but they didn't really start looking until the Monday. By the Sunday, the family had the entire estate out looking, sort of wading through the brooks and ditches, looking under every rock. Nobody really wanted to be the one to find Nicola, but they knew she had to be found. And whilst most of the community did rally around them, strangely, Jason and his family, the Cooks, seemed to be sort of less enthused about the search. No one paid it much mind at the time, they all said. Everyone was just focused on Nicola. But on the Sunday, Jason and his brothers allegedly came driving across the black pad and asked if there had been any luck. When they were told no, nobody had seen Nicola yet, they just sort of like ambled back to their car and left. They didn't join in. Throughout the entire investigation, it's said that the cooks kept themselves to themselves, although it is said that they did later help the police with their official inquiries and they cared for Owen throughout the entire process. As I said, the police investigation didn't really truly start until the Monday, although she'd been reported missing on the Saturday. Now retired superintendent Malcolm Ross became the one in charge of this investigation, saying that he was first informed of the case on the Sunday evening, after all the sort of like usual initial inquiries in a missing persons case had been done. At this point, the senior officer on duty had apparently looked over this case and he determined that Nicola was just a a missing person, that she'd gone inexplicably to an acid house party and there was no need to involve the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department. However, when Ross took a look over this case on the Sunday evening, he realised quite quickly that this was more serious than that. Nicola had never done anything like this before, she wasn't a seasoned runaway and there was no sign that she was planning to leave and and two days on, she still wasn't home. On the Monday, with the police now fully involved, things really kicked up a gear. They had mounted officers, dogs, helicopters, search teams, all out joining the search. 
Investigators cut down all the thick bracken in the black pad, hoping to find her, and then they found out about a small necklace that Nicola would always wear. So instead, they focused their search on the necklace. If there was some sort of assault, the necklace may have come off, and that might be a clue. This search ended up going on for weeks after having to be stopped for two days because of the snow, making it impossible to search for such a delicate item. They really, really focused on finding that necklace, even though there was, wasn't really any evidence that it would have come off Nicola's body. Over the coming days, multiple witnesses would report sightings of Nicola on her journey to her parents' house on that Saturday. Jason's mum was stood in the window of their home waiting for a friend and she saw Nicola come out of the front door and walk down towards the black pad. There was a man called Malcolm Brannan who was out repairing his car when he recognised Nicola by sight. He knew that she was a girl who often stayed at the cook's house and he said that she walked past him and he saw as she disappeared into the fog into the black pad in the correct direction of her parents' house. He said this would have been around 12.15pm which matches up with the timeline. Another witness called Dawn McKay was in the car with her husband and she was discussing how she wanted him to buy her some boots for Christmas. She saw Nicola walking in her pixie boots and pointed her out to her husband, saying that they were the kind of boots that she wanted. However, she reported that Nicola was actually walking away from the black pad, not towards it, and this was around 12.20pm. Mark Williams Thomas of the aforementioned podcast NewsQuest Investigates was actually able to access the original case files for Nicola's case and in reviewing them he believes that he's come across a witness who is maybe dismissed in the initial investigation but actually holds vital information. A man called Ron described being on a bank trying to fly a model helicopter when he saw a girl who was crouched down on the freezing ground. This was said to be on the Saturday afternoon and Ron said that he wondered what on earth this girl was doing crouching down on the ground on this freezing cold day and she was just acting very strangely. He said he thought at the time about going to see if she was alright but decided against it and just went on with his day but he did mention it to his wife when he got home. Later on, when he found out the news about Nicola Payne, he wondered if maybe he'd seen something significant. It was reported to the police at the time, but never really followed up on, but if this was indeed Nicola Payne, it would change the entire timeline of the investigation, because this sighting came at 3.30pm. Another witness came in the form of a neighbour called Pat Carter and he said that he'd been walking his dog that day when he saw two men acting very suspiciously on the black pad. Now Pat has been described as being quite a small man, he was very intimidated by these men, so he made a sort of conscious effort to steer clear of them and they just gave him all round a very bad feeling. And then Pat heard a woman scream. This information was later told to Nicola's aunt who passed it on to John and Maz. He also reported seeing quite a distinctive car which to this day would become a main focal point of the investigation. It didn't take long for this case to start receiving a lot of media attention which is always a double-edged sword. These cases are often solved by tips coming in from the public and you've got to ensure that people know about it to know to be on the lookout for Nicola. But then there's also the people who just want to get involved, who will send in bogus tips just to feel a part of something, just to mess with the investigation. I'll personally never be able to understand the mindset of that, but it is a risk you have with every single investigation. And investigators have always got to spend significant time sort of filtering through all the tips they get in. They've got to figure out what's legitimate and what's not. The sighting of the two men though, along with the very distinctive car, has always been considered to be a very legitimate lead. According to West Midlands Police, these two men were seen close to Cardinal Wiseman School next to a metallic blue Ford Capri. The men are both described as white, one being six foot tall, well built and wearing a brown leather jacket, whilst the other was about 6'3", thin, with short brown hair and a left side parting, wearing a brown bomber style leather jacket, hooded sweatshirt and light blue jeans. The car had a black spoiler, chrome wheels and may have had a V registration. In more recent years, police have really pushed this information, asking the public to come forward with any information about any of these, these people or the car. But it seems in those early days, they thought they already knew who these men were. The witness, Pat, apparently described the car as having a unique black skirting around it. And upon hearing this, Nicola's brother, Gary, realized he knew somebody with a car like this. 
Nigel Barwell. The Paynes informed the police of this information and just left it with them. Apparently this guy didn't have the best reputation in the area and he'd been in a lot of trouble with the law. He was very known to the police. He was also likely known to Nicola as well as he was friends with one of Jason's brothers. The police did some inquiries surrounding this lead and on the Sunday night, they actually brought in Barwell and his associate and brother-in-law, Thomas O'Reilly, for questioning. This all happened incredibly quickly. They were, like I said, they were brought in for the questioning on the Sunday night before Pat Carter had even spoken to the police himself. Remember, he told this information to Nicola's family, but not to the police yet. As Pat arrived at the station himself to make his statement, he saw Barwell's Capri in the car park and he pointed it out, immediately saying that's the car he saw at the black pads. However, in questioning, Barwell and O'Reilly said that they'd actually been in rugby that day and that evening having a drink, and they'd fallen asleep in the car in the car park. They didn't get back to Coventry until the next day. They said they couldn't get the car started, so they couldn't return home, and it was a whole thing. The story was definitely a little bit strange, but it couldn't be disproven at this time, and seeing as there was no cause to detain them, they had to be let go. Superintendent Ross would say in the Never Ending Murder documentary about Nicola's story that he always feels like at this point they missed out on a chance to forensically examine the car and he wishes he could go back and redo that. By the Monday morning, as Nicola still hadn't been found, investigators made some sort of preliminary inquiries with the Warwickshire police who would have covered rugby, finding that O'Reilly and Barwell's alibis just didn't work. Superintendent Ross instructed then that they both be arrested on suspicion of abduction. So three days into this investigation, you've got two arrests. Upon further questioning though, they stuck to their story about staying in a car park in rugby. They said they visited their friends for the day in rugby before they went to the pub and then they inexplicably slept in their car. But everything they said was kind of very vague and investigators just didn't really believe their story. So investigators went to rugby council to speak to the car park attendant who would have been in charge of checking for expired tickets that night. And he did indeed attend the car park in question on the Saturday. He said he didn't recall seeing a Ford Capri, let alone one with two sleeping men inside of it. Their story was clearly full of holes and it became very clear that they hadn't been to rugby, but investigators didn't know where they'd been. Because of this lack of evidence, the two men had to be released on bail. Now, they could have been held for 48 hours with no charge, but they weren't on the basis they come back the following week and stand in an identification parade. But they didn't, they just never turned up back at the police station. Knowing that Barwell was being looked out for Nicholas's disappearance, a neighbour, a witness, came forward to the police, stating that on the Saturday afternoon, she was looking out of her window and saw Barwell and O'Reilly taking a bin bag out of the boot of their car when they were supposedly in rugby. When police went round to the neighbours to take a statement though, she suddenly changed her story, saying that she'd been mistaken. She said she'd seen them on the Tuesday, not on the Saturday but she also said that Barwell had paid her a visit in the previous couple of days. Investigators believed that she was scared, but there was little they could do about that. On the Sunday afternoon, Barwell was also seen by witnesses by neighbours cleaning his car in the pouring rain. Eventually, the pair just disappeared. They didn't turn up for the identity parade and then they were gone. At this point, nobody had any idea where they were. And then about two or three weeks after Nicholas's disappearance, strange calls started coming in to the Payne's house and the local radio stations. Maz described answering the phone to a man saying, dead or alive, but this was just the icing on the cake. The man on the phone said that he had Nicola. He made threats about what he was going to do with her. Over the course of multiple calls, he said enough things to capture the attention of investigators, and they didn't assume that he was the one responsible, in fact, they assumed it was likely a hoax, but on the off chance it might be something, Superintendent Ross actually went on to the local radio and made a plea for the caller to call back, to tell him what he knew. And it worked, he called back, they were able to keep him on the line long enough to trace the call. And they were able to trace this to a hotel in Stratford, to a member of staff called Christopher Parker. Parker was arrested and interviewed and he admitted to 18 false calls for which he was later charged and imprisoned. 
The police spent so many hours tracing this call that could have been much better used for actually searching for Nicola. This did untold damage. It was clear very quickly that he wasn't the one responsible for her abduction, but obviously he messed with the investigation. But this caller wasn't the only one subverting police resources because in a very similar time frame, three more women had disappeared. Julie Dart, Stephanie Slater, and Barbara Finn. Julie was 18 years old. She was kidnapped in Leeds in July 1991, so about five months before Nicola, after leaving her boyfriend's house. 10 days later, her body was discovered in a farmer's field in Grantham in Lincolnshire. Michael Sams was later convicted of her murder alongside that of Stephanie Slater. Stephanie was an estate agent attending a property viewing on January 22nd, 1992, when the potential buyer turned out to be Sam to abducted her at knife point. Could Sams have been responsible for Nicola's murder too? After trial, Maz actually wrote to Sam's in prison in the hope that he could maybe provide some answers. And like, she wasn't even accusing him personally, but was instead asking for his help in the investigation. He'd know the mind of a person like this. He had this kind of insider knowledge. And Sam's actually did reply from his prison cell saying that if he could help, he would have, but he had no answers for her. And then there was the case of Barbara Finn, who vanished after leaving home in the Hillfields area of Coventry on the 28th of October, 1991. Now, unlike Nicola, Barbara was a sex worker and it was always assumed that her disappearance was linked to her job. But like Nicola, she was a young mum who'd left her daughter with relatives to go to work. So could there be any link there? Well, maybe nothing solid has ever been made. A few months into the investigation, so we're now in early March 1992, Barwell and O'Reilly just reappeared, saying they were now willing to stand in an ID parade immediately, and they said they'd spent the last three months in France with very little explanation. In this time, they'd both changed their appearance. They'd grown their hair out, dyed it, and grew facial hair, and the witnesses didn't identify them. According to the laws at this time, police couldn't ask them to shave or change their appearance back. So again, they had to be let go. And after following over 2,000 lines of inquiry, the case went cold. Investigators felt like they'd done everything that could be done at this time, but of course, the pains weren't going to accept that. They continued with their own investigation. They went out into the streets, raising as much awareness as they could, something they're still trying to do to this very day in 2023. As you can imagine, this whole situation was incredibly tough on the family. Maz said that she sat on one end of the sofa for five straight weeks after Nicola disappeared, that she just couldn't move her body, she was frozen. John refused to lock the front door in case Nicola came home, meaning that their sons had to sleep on the living room floor in case somebody tried to break in. They were just keeping an eye out. In all these years, they never changed their phone number, even after eventually moving house. It's said they kept incredibly dignified throughout this entire process, stoic and strong. But in hindsight, it was very clear they were suffering with some form of PTSD, as might be expected. They knew that something terrible had happened to Nicola. Maz said she knew straight away that she'd be murdered. It was just so out of character for her not to come home to just abandon her son. John says that he took longer to come to terms with the fact that she was probably murdered. He said that he was in denial for a really long time, especially as she was walking back home to see him. Of course, it's not John's fault. There's no way he's responsible for somebody else murdering his daughter. But it's really hard to live with that feeling of what if? What if they just done one thing differently? Time passed slowly, and after two years, the Paynes personally offered a £10,000 reward for any information as to Nicola's whereabouts. But eventually, their focus had to turn to Owen, knowing that Nicola would still want them to have a big part in their grandson's life. They did share custody of Owen for a bit, although their access was eventually restricted by court order. But the Paynes say in the Never Ending Murder documentary that they always found it very sort of strange how little involvement the Cooks had in the search for Nicola. Jason always remained in very loose contact, he had to for Owen, but the rest of the Cooks never really showed much interest in the investigation. Nicola's brother points out that if that was the mother of your child, wouldn't you have a sort of vested interest in her being found? 
Of course, you never know how somebody's going to act in their grief after something like this happens. How do you act? But to just ignore it? The pains felt it was very odd behavior, but what can you do about it? It's not criminal. They didn't do anything wrong. They just didn't react the way the pains necessarily wanted them to react. The case really does go cold, but there are a few moments of hope over the next few years. The Paynes make an effort to keep Nicola's name in the press, especially around Christmas where every year they'd make fresh appeals. They say with each passing year it gets more difficult instead of easier, each Christmas is harder than the last. They've never quite been able to move past it, all they want is answers, all they want is Nicola's body. In April 1996, following a tip-off, the police excavate the garden of a property on Woodway Lane, but despite 12 hours of searching, they find nothing, yet another dead end. In December 1998, John and Maz make a new appeal, but nothing of note comes forward. In 2001, a witness brings forward fresh information, which leads to a part of the Oxford Canal in Angsty, which is a village northeast of Coventry, being dredged. Again, nothing is found. Later that year, bones are found near the site of Nicholas's disappearance, but they turn out to be animal remains. In May 2005, a series of adverts are displayed on Ford lorries to appeal for new information about Nicholas's case, and they remain in place for a year. Again, nothing. Her case is also featured on the TV show The Missing in the December as well. Again, nothing. In March 2007, the major investigation unit finally takes control of this investigation. And it's probably important to note that whilst this case did go cold, it was never officially closed. It was just a case of there were no new leads to follow. There wasn't much point keeping a team actively on it with no information to go off of. But every time new information was brought forward, it was looked into. Now this is the year that Nicholas' son Owen officially turned 16 and he personally made a fresh appeal for his mum. Maz read out a statement at a press conference which he became too upset to attend, saying, My one wish would be to have my mum found to be able to understand the confusion, mystery and heartbreak of the past 16 years. I was just seven months old when my lovely mum Nikki went missing. Nan and Grandad always say she had a loving bond with me, which was noticeable to all. Sadly, I have no memories of her and I envy my older cousins who remember her very well, and they tell me what a fun loving girl she was. During my early years at school, I wish that my mum could meet me at the school gates as other mums did with my friends. And it seems like this time, finally, this appeal did lead to some new leads because on 1st of November, a 37-year-old man from Derbyshire was arrested on suspicion of abducting and murdering Nicola. He was brought in for questioning, but was later released on bail. By March 2008, he's let go with no charges brought against him. But following this renewed fire in the investigation, in June 2008, police dig up another garden, this time on Winston Avenue, although they did emphasise that they were not interested in the current residents of the home. I can only assume that they moved into the property in the years between Nicola going missing and the search. Around 20 officers are involved in the investigation. They're using specialist radar and x-ray equipment. John says at this point to think it could just be there within yards of where I've been looking for 16 years. It's just unbelievable. But once again, nothing ended up being found. Although these sort of like random searches were done following leads over the years, it wasn't until 2012 that the case actually started to be properly investigated again. A detective called Martin Slevin was asked to review intelligence that came in around 2007 or 2008 in regards to an informant's father and brother. This informant told investigators that Nicola had been buried in an area known as Purcell Field, an area of open wasteland about a mile away from the Black Pad. The informant said his father had helped dispose of Nicola's body after his brother, so the father's son and the informant's brother, had knocked Nicola over in his car. A few weeks after Nicola's disappearance, this son committed suicide and interestingly, he drove a dark coloured Ford Capri. This tip-off led to a forensic search of Purcell Fields using the latest technology and cadaver dogs. The expectation was that something would be found. This informant seemed really sure of his information, but yet again, they found nothing of note, although many potential witnesses did come forward after this, all telling very similar stories leading back to the same person. 
The informant and his father would actually be arrested on conspiracy to prevent the lawful and decent burial of a body, and the informant's house was searched along with the father's, but in the end, neither father or son would be charged of anything. It turns out that this informant had told his story to multiple people over the years, and so all the witnesses that came forward after this, or like backing up the story, had just been told it by him. He was just a liar, he wanted to boost his own ego, he wanted people to talk about him, he wanted to be the centre of attention. And because of this, he brought untold pain to Nicola's family, who really thought that the closure they needed was now on the horizon. This was a massive search using massive police resources, and again, it led to nothing. At the time of Nicholas's disappearance, Martin Slevins, who'd overseen this whole search, was just a police officer, but by 2012, he was a detective inspector in charge of one of the major investigation teams in Coventry. He spent a lot of time in 2012 with the Paynes, and he really got to know the family, he got to know their pain. At this point, he'd only been given permission to look at this sort of like one line of inquiry in Nicola's case, but after a sort of heart to heart with the pains, he knew he wanted to give the whole investigation a proper chance again. He knew this was gonna be an absolutely mammoth task to go in from the beginning, but it was one that he hoped would be worthwhile, and the force agreed that he could properly reopen this case. So he pulled all of the old documents, 36 boxes of documents, in an attempt to understand this case. A fresh set of eyes might be exactly what was needed on this case, and hopefully 21 years on, more people would be willing to talk. Slevins' first port of call was to review all of the people of interest from over the years and to ensure that each one had actually been properly eliminated. And as he did that, it left him with just two names that he kept coming back around to, Nigel Barwell and Thomas O'Reilly. They still felt inexplicably connected to this case, they couldn't be shaken. A pocket notebook entry from one of the officers working this case in the early days states that Barwell had actually been hanging around outside his home around one hour before Nicola went missing, which is vital, as if you remember his alibi, they were in rugby until the Sunday morning. So Slevins went back to the witnesses who had refused to make statements back in 1991 out of fear, but this time they spoke. And this ignited the brand new investigation, it was the first sort of tangible thing to go on. In December 2012, the authorities appeal once again for information from the public regarding the two men and Ford Capri seen close when Nicola had gone missing. And they knew themselves that these two men were very likely Barwell and O'Reilly, but they just needed further confirmation from the public. They needed new leads. In January 2013, investigators said that 25 new leads had been produced on the back of the appeal, which they then spent the year investigating. In the December, new forensic tests were carried out on the items recovered during the inquiry, and then three people were arrested. Two men on suspicion of abduction and murder, and a woman on suspicion of perverting the course of justice. The still unnamed woman would later be released without charge, but the two men, of course being 51-year-old Barwell and 50-year-old O'Reilly, would be publicly named in January 2015, at which point they were charged with Nicola's abduction and murder. But before that point, the case around the men had to be built. In the original investigation back in 1991, a tent had been recovered close to Barwell's house. Now inside his car, investigators found pitching instructions for a tent of the exact same make, so it was deduced that this tent belonged to him and for whatever reason had been abandoned. However, despite forensic analysis at the time, nothing of use was found. But in the reinvestigation, Slevin decided to have it retested in 2014, and inside the tent, they were able to recover three hairs, finding that hair number one was 900 million times more likely to be from Nicola Payne rather than someone biologically unrelated to her. In short, somehow Nicola's hair had got inside this tent. It was also eventually broken to the family that pubic hair of Nicola's was also found, the implications of which being that she was likely sexually assaulted before her death, and this was incredibly painful for them to hear. 
Alongside this, they also found another hair that didn't belong to Nicola, with mitochondrial DNA finding that it either belonged to Thomas O'Reilly or his sister, Mary O'Reilly. Now, Mary was actually married to Nigel Barwell, so either way you looked at it, this was conclusive proof that this tent had been in their possession at some point. This was the first solid evidence they had, something that wasn't just witness testimony or hearsay or circumstantial. They had DNA proof, like this was it, right? And so Barwell and O'Reilly were arrested and charged jointly with Nicola's murder in January 2015. The trial began in October with both men pleading not guilty and the defence posed a very important question. Did Nicola know Barwell? The prosecution put forward this idea that she'd gotten into his car before she was murdered, but she wouldn't have got into the car of somebody she didn't know, that just wasn't Nicola, so did she know him? One witness testified that yes, he'd seen them in a pub a couple of months beforehand. Barwell was with Mick Cook, the older brother of Jason Cook, Nicola's boyfriend. So yeah, it seems that Barwell would have known her even if just in passing. But overall, the trial did not go the way the prosecution hoped it would. A huge amount of this case depended on witness testimonies, but very few of the witnesses performed as well on the stand as they did when speaking to investigators. By Martin Slevens' own admission, the defence counsel in this case were incredibly talented and they were able to rip apart witness testimonies left, right and centre. So in the end, this entire case came down to the tent and the DNA evidence found inside. That became literally the entire case, it all hung on that one thing. But frustratingly, the defence were able to show that the tent had not been properly sealed when it was originally brought into the forensic lab all those years before in 1991. So much so that actually at the time, the scientist on duty refused to do a fibroid hair examination as things could easily have transferred and she agreed only to take a visual look at the tent for blood spots. Simply, the tent hadn't been looked after. There was a huge issue with evidence not being stored properly. And knowing this was going to be a risk in court, Slevins did pay for scientists to assess the probability of cross-contamination. But in the end, it didn't matter because this was never going to hold up in court. Cross-contamination is a huge issue. You cannot convict somebody when there's a chance that these hairs could have got there. God knows how. The trial ended on Friday the 13th of November 2015 and by the Monday the jury returned with their verdict, not guilty. The pains broke down in that courtroom having to be held up by their loved ones. No matter what your views are on this, Barwell and O'Reilly were not guilty and you have to respect the courts. Could the outcome have been different if the forensic evidence had been properly maintained, properly sealed? Maybe, but at this point we'll never know. Out of curiosity, I had a look at our double jeopardy laws here in the UK and found that they were actually scrapped in 2005, allowing police to bring offenders to justice if they have new and compelling evidence against them. However, there are really, really strict safeguarding laws around this to ensure that it's just not abused by prosecutors if they don't get the result they want the first time around. For a new trial to happen, there has to be brand new evidence that has recently been found and it has to be approved by the Director of Public Prosecutions. So yes, technically, if new evidence comes to light, Barwell and O'Reilly could be retried, but chances are that's not gonna happen. It has to be pretty much solid evidence. It has to be like 100% proof that they did it. If there's not been any solid evidence against them in over 30 years, there's likely not going to be at this point. As far as law is concerned, they are innocent men and there's every chance that that is the case. They may well be innocent. But after the outcome of this trial, investigators weren't about to give up on Nicola's case. They wanted to find her body. And the trial did bring a lot of attention to her story, meaning that still people were coming forward with brand new information. In 2016, it was revealed that a new witness had come forward stating that Nicola had been seen with two men at Coombe Abbey Fisheries in Warwickshire on the day of her disappearance. Martin Slevin said, this is the first time we have a definite witness that's pointed us to a specific site. And I'm confident from the information that this has given us that Nicola was brought to that site on the day she vanished. Apparently, on the afternoon Nicola disappeared around 3.30 or 4pm, a witness stopped at the fisheries for a bite to eat. He said he noticed a car and saw a man at the passenger door and he said hello, as you do. He then saw a second man come out of the woods and the second man said to the first man to grab the witness because he'd seen too much. 
The witness luckily managed to escape. He jumped back in his car and drove away, but it was a very suspicious interaction. A big question has been, why didn't this witness report this before? Well, he said that he never made the connection to Nicola's disappearance until he was watching the coverage of the trial on TV. And they mentioned the blue metallic Ford Capri. The witness said the car in question here was a blue metallic sports car. But again, I do find myself wondering why he didn't report this strange situation at all at the time, even if he made no connection to Nicola. If that was me, I'd probably like call the police and be like, just to let you know, this weird thing happened, maybe go take a look. But hey, I'm not the investigator here. Obviously, by this point, hopes have been dashed so many times, but Nicola's family still just want to find her. So a search was done in this area of Coombe Abbey through the dense undergrowth and debris. They sought the intelligence of all sorts of plant experts and scientists. They found old bottles and shoes that had been dumped in the area after the war. And at one point they thought that some of these boots might be Nicholas Pixie boots, but they weren't. This was a huge search using massive amounts of police resources and once again, nothing came of it. They didn't find anything after a 10 month search. 2016 marked the 25th anniversary of Nicholas' disappearance and the family are still trying to raise as much awareness as possible. Maz appealed to the younger members of her family, fearing her own life was coming to an end. She asked them to never give up and if Nicholas found, to give her a good send-off. The £10,000 reward for information about Nicholas' disappearance has stood for many years at this point, but in 2017, the Payne family increased this reward to £30,000, with money out of their own pockets and from fundraising campaigns. In 2018, an anonymous donor offered their own reward of £100,000. Despite the knocks over the years, Nicola's family are still determined to find her. They began to work with a private forensic search team of ex-military experts who used sonar and ground radar equipment to search the area around Coombe Country Park. Investigators are now pretty certain that Nicola will be found in this area instead. Again, she is not found, but even if she is, they know that finding a body isn't necessarily going to provide answers as to who hurt her, as to what happened to her on that day in December. Except for maybe if there's forensic evidence found alongside it, there is always a chance. In January 2019, West Midlands Police announced they had new information and once again they were working with a specialist underwater search team to examine a stretch of canal between Coventry and Rugby near the Armada boatyard. Yet again, nothing was found. So many searches have been done over the years and I have no doubt there will be many more to come, but the pains just want her to come home. They want her to be laid to rest, to know that she's finally at peace. Given the choice between finding Nicola and bringing her killers to justice, they just want to find her. In February 2021, a vigil is held to mark the 30th anniversary of Nicola's disappearance, at which point her brother Nigel said, we're not chasing to point blame, we're not chasing to put people in prison. All we want is my sister home so my mum and dad can bury her and have a place to go and grieve. It's ruined our family, totally, absolutely crucified it, split it into bits. Sadly, in March this year, 2023, Maz Payne died without ever knowing what happened to her daughter. She's described as being a tenacious woman who never gave up, extraordinarily brave and strong. As of now, Nicola's case remains open and unsolved and the campaign to find her continues through her surviving family members. It is widely believed at this stage that Nicola was abducted, murdered, and then her body was dumped somewhere, likely buried. Despite this bleak probability, her family still hope to find her and have her brought home and buried near their family at long last. Anyone with information about Nicola's disappearance should contact the homicide team on 101 or use the live chat feature west-midlands.police.uk between 8am and midnight. Alternatively, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111. No one is giving up on Nicola or her family, they're determined to find answers, but you can't find answers without leads. Thank you so much for tuning in today and choosing to spend this time with me and with Nicola. Hopefully there will be answers as to her case. The Payne family are determined to never give up and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.